Okay. If you are, are you ready? I am ready. Thank you. Everything is. Everyone is here. Okay. So you can begin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning. My name is Lukman Ismaila, and today I'm excited to present my work on machine learning application in neuroscience for brain tumor recession procedure. This work is under the guidance of uh, Professor David Russo, Dr. Fedman Rusty, and Dr. John Michel Lamy. And my jury members is composed of uh, Professor Elias Zamora, Professor Hassan Demir, Dr. Stephanie Brick, and um, our invited guest, who is um, Dr. Hola. Brain tumor presents a significant health threat all around the world, and with about five years survival rate of only 35% in France. Prognosis of patients with brain tumor remains a significant health threat and therefore needs further improvement. This PhD, which uh, aims to um, make this procedure a lot easier, it is in fact necessary at this point to um, perform what we refer to as benefit to risk ratio before the neurosurgery can actually take place. And to do this, it is critical to locate the uh, functional brain networks surrounding the brain tumor in order case to be able to do this. And this PhD focused on improving uh, tumor research procedure through craniotomy approach, among other um, critical stages in the tumor treatment. We illustrate the entire process from the onset We, sorry about that. we illustrate the entire process um, starting from the onset of um, patient symptoms of brain tumor, which generally follows by um, the stabilization and investigation stage. And if necessary, then uh, proceed through the neurosurgery or the recession procedure, where in fact, at this point, it requires the neurosurgeon to actively try as much as possible to um, remove the brain mass in the case of uh, full recession, the entire brain mass, and of course, partial recession in the case of uh, partial uh, uh, recession. And to do this, the craniotomy approach actually requires um, adequate understanding of several brain regions to allow surgical access to the uh, lesion. Preoperatively, a magnetic resonance machine is used to view the internal uh, regions of the brain. And this allows the understanding of the various areas of the brain. While this is achieved by correlating the cerebral blood flow changes uh, to be able to understand the uh, brain neural activity. And interestingly, this entire procedure is non-invasive. And this non-invasive procedure uh, helps to minimize post-operative deficit by allowing the neurosurgeon to avoid unconcerned region during the tumor research procedure. From the uh, main approach of, of performing this fMRI uh, data acquisition, uh, where we have the tax base, which requires cognitive uh, um, contribution of the patients, and of course, the resting state, which um, does not. Um, there has been wide interest among researchers and practitioners on the advantages of the resting state over the tax base due to several reasons like the highest re the greatest reliability and of course the fact that there is greater coverage of the brain and th there is no reliance to cognitive uh, um, cooperation of the brain among others despite this appealing nature of the resting state fmri sadly it is not the um, clinical routine because of the need to actually have an expert reviewer who has to manually identify each functional network and uh, thankfully, recent advances in machine learning and computer vision could provide complementary effort to actually address such a critical problem. From the onset, as our initial step, we to standardize this resting state approach to become a clinical or part of a clinical routine, something that can be considered for uh, the preoperative procedure. We propose an automatic recognition of uh, functional brain networks using machine learning algorithms, and to enhance the practicability of these. Uh, data driven approach, we investigate some of the critical concerns around this for which we term as um, research questions. First, um, how can we effectively automate the recognition of functional brain network? 
in the case of unhealthy patients, knowing fully well that we have limited availability of this data, right? This is, um, it's a critical stage because at this point, it leads us to actually acquire more healthy data, which of course um, requires data annotation. And of course, takes us to the second level where we seek to avoid the annotation that is required in the case of um, unhealthy, in the case of healthy data. Thirdly, we want to um, find the source of the discrepancy that actually exists between our data in the terms of the healthy and unhealthy data. And for the rest of my presentation, I will be discussing the supervised automatic recognition of functional brain networks, which is inclined towards addressing the um, raised research question one, and of course the self-supervision learning approach of fMRI, which is inclined uh, towards our research question two, and the fMRI image data discrepancy in healthy and unhealthy data, which is inclined towards the research question three, and of course we discuss our conclusion and share some of our perspectives. Functional magnetic resonance imaging plays very important role in identifying um, each functional brain networks. And the resting state fMRI, in this case, actually allows the identification in um, patients who cannot perform cognitive tasks. This is a very important uh, possibility because it allows wider um, and critical aspect of the population to perform this um, fMRI procedure. We talk about patients who are not able to perform cognitive tasks like the young children, and of course, some um, patients in severe brain injury or sedated patients as you, you might have. Uh, sadly, this is not the clinical routine because of um, the necessity to have an expert reviewer whose main task is actually to manually annotate um, uh, data. And again, it's, it's been difficult because the limited availability of unhealthy data has prevented the possibility of this approach which we um, intend to embark on, which usually followed by the block of genetic level dependence imaging, which in simple terms is a way to show the activated regions of the brain. And for ROS, where we are inclined towards the resting state approach, where in fact there is no cognitive uh, uh, requirement of the patient, we at this point have acquired um, about 55 unhealthy patients' data. And additionally, as mentioned, we extend this effort by acquiring, um, um, enrolling some volunteer patients who we term as healthy data, which is, comes in the amount of our H2. And from the um, independent components, we have extracted uh, 55 features from these components. And seven of these corresponds to seven functional brain networks. And each of the identified functional brain networks were actually labeled by an expert without any disagreement. It's uh, At this point, I would like to point out that um, the entire pre-processing stage was carried out by uh, a neuro-oncology expert who happened to be my supervisor at the CSU Onje, following the, um, the clinical standard. So from the data acquisition where we actually have um, seven activated images of functional brain networks, in the case of healthy data and of course unhealthy data, additional to this, we have what we refer to as lesion mass, and you're currently looking through the brain volume of um, a sample language network. Uh, and the first part here, which is um, the TMAPS, or we refer to this as the gray level image, and the equivalent thresholded copy, where we simply um, tend to stand out the activation, activated regions of, of this um, um, functional map. And of course, the C, where we have the uh, lesion mask, which points out the region of uh, where the brain tumor is actually present. Of course, it's all together uh, some volumes. So we describe our entire uh, pipeline for this experiment from the onset of um, um, expert leveling, as mentioned, which is followed by the fMRI uh, data set creation. We have, of course, for the case of healthy data and unhealthy data. And this allows us to implement some shallow learning algorithms some machine learning algorithms, uh, we term this as basic, which is actually currently the, the, the standard. And for the first time, we introduced a deep, an end-to-end -end deep learning algorithm, which allows us to perform seven functional brain network. And at this point, we also um, perform what we refer to the algorithm ranking, which in fact uh, lead us to inquire some of the available work at this point by looking through the um, work done by <clears throat> by Michelle, 
which um, seek to perform the functional network recognition using canonical, canonical seed region of interest. Uh, quite uh, an interesting work as well, which we did look at at this point. And we seek to further um, push our, uh, optimize our model, uh, their image augmentation approach, and of course, our transfer learning approach. At the level of the proposed deep learning, we started by actually looking through the, uh, the classical algorithms. These are the, so to say, the state of the art, right? And in implementing this, like ResNet, the BGG-16, um, and of course the DenseNet, which usually come with um, a large training architecture and large training parameters. This tends to be some advantage, but um, <clears throat> sadly, for the case of our unhealthy data, we um, observe some limitations in form of um, data incompatibility, which in fact pushed us to perform some interpolation on our data and uh, allowed, at this point, has affected the actual features we try to preserve, which leads to result to uh, uh, be observed only around 50 to 55%. Uh, and at this point, we were, of course, um, motivated to propose a custom CNN model, which is simply um, a three-layer convolutional neural network and 156, um, one uh, fully connected to 56 neuron for um, seven functional brain network, which at this point allows us to impute our entire brain volume for seven functional brain network classification. We then evaluated our shallow learning as well as our um, deep learning algorithms. And of course, um, based on the results, we observed the superiority of convolutional neural network in um, the status of the healthy data classification and of course the unhealthy data. And of course, our effort to compare this with current existing work um, also allow us to see that uh, even for the close related work, this um, tends to stand out. We further explored the possibility to compensate for the limited unhealthy data as mentioned. And at this point, we drive our passion towards um, the uh, simulation of clinical noise, which is actually the noise that exists in, in uh, fMRI. And we have simulated all of these in the options of um, elastic transformation and so on, among several other um, clinical noise simulation. For example, the grid distortion, which seek to uh, um, simulate the effective, the distortive effect of brain tumor uh, as illustrated here, where we can see some push around in the brain volume mass. Uh, I hope this is uh, visible enough. And as illustrated with the language network, this approach actually helps us to push our accuracy for that to about 88%. And we further approach the transfer learning, which is another interesting possibility where we have the opportunity to train larger volume of our data, the healthy data. And of course, we obtain a pre-trained model here, which allows better initialization for further training and fine tuning with unhealthy data for the seven functional brain network classification. A clear demonstration of transfer of good representation. And at the level of transfer learning, we have proposed feature transferability at primarily three, um, three types. We initially did good transfer learning, where we actually train on healthy data and test on unhealthy data. This is quite, uh, as the name implies, good. We directly want to see the um, features that is recognizable at the level of unhealthy data, knowing fully well that all of the features learned from are from healthy data. And the next is transfer learning, where we um, add more and more unhealthy data in our training cohort for the case of unhealthy data for the entire training procedure. And of course, the weight transfer learning, where we simply fine tune a model weight that is trained on healthy data. At the initial step of brute transfer, we observe uh, the acquired result here, putting it side by side with the baseline, where we have to, which is some um, training on healthy, on unhealthy, and testing on unhealthy. And when we compare this side by side with brute transfer approach, we see um, a sharp drop by one, uh, I could say one percent, one percent. And of course, the mixed transfer learning, where we uh, demonstrate a stepwise increment of the amount of unhealthy data in our training cohort which um, in fact shows that for progressive amount of unhealthy data in our training cohort, not only does it help to st stabilize the um, uh, evaluation, but also increase the uh, uh, accuracy at this point. And sadly, of course, we do not have an um, infinite amount of unhealthy data to continue to add. 
and the next, which is um, the weight transfer uh, approach, where we fine tune on model weight that has been trained on healthy data. And to put this all of all of this together, we can see that um, from our, our model, especially when we put the baseline side by side with the approach, we could see the sharp drop for the root transfer. And of course, interestingly, some increment in the condition where we are adding more and more uh, unhealthy data in our training cohort. <clears throat> and of course, um, the fine tuning on unhealthy data from a pre-trained healthy model where we are able to achieve uh, a result of about 78. And to put this uh, all together, we can say that, um, in fact, we recorded about 1% increase for every 10 patients added in our training cohort. And this um, case for the weight transfer learning provides the best results and only requires a pre-trained model on health data. We then extend our effort to um, actually evaluate our model in, um, to understand the true positive rate and of course the true negative rate in terms of the sensitivity and specificity, which was done for the case of healthy to healthy training, uh, unhealthy to unhealthy uh, training and validation, and of course extended to the healthy to unhealthy uh, future transfer, which we actually demonstrate. And it was interesting to reveal that the uh, results shown here actually uh, provides the required confidence in medical system, especially in the case of sensitivity, where we have uh, nearly all above uh, 90%. For the conclusion, we propose an end-to-end -end, uh, deep learning algorithm for seven functional brain network classification. And of course, um, we demonstrated uh, transferability from healthy to unhealthy data, which is actually one of the critical possibility that we saw. <clears throat> and also uh, model analysis uh, suggests the existence of discrepancy in our data. And we can say that, of course, um, the future transferability demonstrated in this work is actually very helpful. Nevertheless, if the healthy data annotation remains a, 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 a bottleneck, which is no surprising because um, one of the limitations of Medical imaging research is lack of annotated data set, which is usually um, seen due to prevalence of uh, rare medical condition and, of course, um, uh, the availability of the unfavorable medical um, data distribution policy as maintained by the international community. And lastly, the limited expertise to actually annotate um, healthy or large data set. Some of the ways to tackle this could involve the future learning which is basically um, understanding of feature patterns only from few training samples. Um, this is usually faced by high variability in model performance, especially in the case of uh, medical imaging research. And of course, the learning of feature backbone or what we term as meta-learning is hard to scale and difficult to generalize. The next possibility could have been data generation or generative model um, data augmentation as you may have. And of course, um, this is uh, no news that um, it usually has high computational demand. And of course, the ground truth labeling could be quite uh, complex. And the next possibility, which could be reuse of uh, land representation from model that has been trained on comparative uh, data set. Uh, this in itself does not um, actually eliminate the data annotation, which is quite uh, interesting because we know that the clinician have to manually annotate healthy data. And this procedure is very tedious and um, time consuming. To illustrate, it takes about um, uh, 10 minutes to actually annotate the data of a healthy patient. And of course, about 15 minutes to annotate um, the data of unhealthy uh, patients. And sadly, the entire annotation process uh, has no clinical relevance in brain tumor research and procedure. We seek, so, seek uh, push us to see how can we um, annotate the uh, healthy data and also benefit from the future transfer that is uh, possible here. We directly put this in the concept of self supervision learning, where we illustrate that in fact it is possible to um, acquire a large volume of on label data and provide um, a simple um, pretext task which in this case we illustrate with um, different angle rotated by the data. And we train a convolutional neural network at this point that lends good representation for a rotation classifier, which um, say, for example, for every input image, uh, the model 
tends to tell you what angle it's rotated. In the process, it actually lends good representation. And on the second stage, we simply train the um, linear classifier on the line features using only few level uh, data. Another clear demonstration of learning good representation from context prediction using image augmentation. We further look deep into our data to understand that um, for corresponding functional brain networks, the different functional brain networks that we have, for the case of healthy data and of course unhealthy data, we do not see the lesion mass, in fact, not visible in the case of unhealthy data. And of course, this um, similarity allows the transferability we are talking about. And self-supervision has also been used in the case of um, in patient fatigue based on fMRI patterns. And of course, fMRI scan analysis and visualization in healthy subjects for task recognition. And as a transferability, um, as, as an extension of our transferability work, we propose to investigate uh, the use of self-supervision and also benefit from the similarity that exists between healthy and unhealthy data. To put this back in the context of our data, we can see that, in fact, it allows the possibility to use the entire healthy data without any annotation, and of course, provide some pretext tasks, which could be any image augmentation samples. We simply train a convolutional neural network in this that lends good representation for rotation classifier, just an example in this case. And of course, in the downstream stage, we simply um, train and fine tune with only few level data for um, our functional brain network classification. We further describe the implementation of our contrastive self supervision learning, which is based on the idea of SimCell Lab, where we illustrate, of course, the um, input image data, where we create two augmentation views of this. Our encoder network, our encoder network is based on the base encoder and, of course, the projection head. The projection head in this case um, allows the contrastive loss training why the base encoder is actually what allows us to extract the features of each of the augmentation views. And then the, um, the encoder network allows the, um, or the projection head in this case, allows the maximization of agreement, which seems to be um, the, in terms of comparing the similarity or differences that exist in, this, um, in our data for the contrastive loss training, where we, in fact, um, compare two augmentation views from different uh, origin image versus um, all other images in our training batch using the um, cosine similarity function. For our entire pipeline of this uh, contrastive self supervision level, as illustrated here, from the input images, we provide um, a pretext task, which um, is one of uh, such of image augmentation, and then we train a convolutional neural network which helps to learn some good representation in the process. And we simply train uh, a linear classifier on this, which is used for, of course, the um, contrastive loss maximization of agreement for positive samples, which actually refers to images that come from the same augmentation views, and of course, negative samples, which um, refer to images that come from different augmentation views. And at this point, the attraction and repulsion that we see actually have an interesting effect on the vector space representation, where in fact, more and more attraction tends to bring um, similar augmentation view to the same point or closely related uh, points in the vector space representation. And of course, the uh, negative um, samples tend to pull them further and further away apart in, for generally all our image data. And by the end of this, the training ends up in a very interesting way which um, is nothing less of uh, what we refer to as learning good representation. Because at this point, you can already see that we have about seven groups of class. Nevertheless, we are the first stage of our training, which at this point, we have viewed data without any lab. And at the second stage, we simply apply, uh, we simply train and fine tune with only few labels data that allows the um, labeling of all of this. For our experiment, we describe for uh, the process where we train on healthy data. And of course, we tested on unhealthy data, which allows us to acquire our first baseline result uh, using the ratio of 70 to 80 level, on level to level data, um, where we acquired the first baseline result. And of course, we train on unhealthy data and tested on unhealthy data 
when we acquire our second baseline result using the same ratio. And next, we fine tune on a model weight that has been trained on healthy data for further training and fine tuning with unhealthy data. And lastly, we demonstrate the possibility to use entire on annotated healthy data um, and also using the same ratio for the same CLR model, which allows us to acquire what we refer to as the second baseline result. To put this all together, we can see that our first baseline result actually um, allow us to achieve uh, about 82%, so to speak, for the case of SimCLR compared to CNN. And of course, the second baseline result, um, where we see about 73%, and of course, the wage transfer, where we see a, a sharp drop to about 69 And interestingly, for the new second baseline result, where we were able to use entire on label um, healthy data, we have achieved about 76 and this allows us to say that, in fact, we um, have seen similar performance range was recorded where on level healthy data were used. And um, this entire approach allows us to save about 800 minutes of the clinical expert time by avoiding healthy data annotation. As a summary, we demonstrated the use of self-supervision technique to avoid large data annotation. And this approach was illustrated using um, healthy and healthy fMRI data. And we observed improvement to about 3% in a case where um, unannotated healthy data were used. And this approach actually has significantly saved the time of the clinician. And as a perspective, we could uh, see that uh, this method is applicable to any non-invasive medical imaging task for which there is similarity between healthy and unhealthy data. And also, one can investigate the data discrepancy that was observed in the case of CNN and, of course, the same CLR model. And talking more about the data discrepancy, we can recall that um, we have model prediction of unhealthy data, and we tested this on healthy data. The future transfer actually shows the existence of similarity. Sadly, when we do validation on this data, we could see that um, there is significant drop in the case of unhealthy data, which one can imagine that perhaps there is just uh, a difficulty in recognizing unhealthy data, or in fact, we're only witnessing the distortive effect of um, brain tumor on the functional network activation maps. And um, this um, data discrepancy was actually, is actually critical to be able to um, understand the global and local relationship that may exist in our fMRI healthy and unhealthy data. And of course, to reduce the possibility of randomness in a model prediction to, to the barest minimum. We further look through our um, healthy to our uh, deep learning classification model results, where we have tested for healthy training and validation to see a result of about 86. And of course, um, unhealthy training and validation where we've seen result of about um, 75. It's interesting to say that um, the transfer learning approach demonstrated could not fully compensate for the um, gap left between healthy and unhealthy data. And additionally, even though despite the advantages of uh, self-supervision to actually allow um, the use of unannotated data, the gap still remains, which pushes us to inquire, how can we uh, explore or a multi-technique uh, approach to actually investigate the identified discrepancy. For the data discrepancy, data discrimination between healthy and unhealthy data, uh, we explored the deep learning approach via the binary classification using the latent space representation and of course the grad cam visualization and statistical uh, approach was also done to be able to um, compare two critical regions of our of our data in the form of um, either the tumor regions and the surrounding regions or the regions of activation versus the region of uh, non-activation to see how all of this affects. And lastly, we also compared for the uh, network volume analysis. At the step of our binary classification between healthy and unhealthy data, where in fact all seven functional brain networks were defined using the same levels, we um, have seen a result to about um, 95%, uh, which in fact indicates that 
the convolutional approach provides evidence of strong data distinguishability. And further analysis on these with our uh, computer computation metrics, where we can see that um, we have uh, just about six points of uh, misclassification of uh, um, false negative where healthy data were misclassified. And for our latent space representation, it is um, obvious to see that, um, in fact, there is wider distance between uh, functional brain networks, each of the functional brain networks, compared to the case of uh, uh, healthy and unhealthy data, which is rather mixed, as we can see, rather mixed, where we, we, we can um, hardly identify the difference that exists between healthy and unhealthy data. Nevertheless, there is wide margin between uh, uh, different functional brain networks. And for the case of uh, binary classification, where we represent uh, our healthy and unhealthy data, it, it can be said that um, the um, latent space representation of healthy and unhealthy data are actually a lot easier at global level uh, compared to the uh, case of uh, several functional brain network. And of course, this distinguish distinguishability conforms to the uh, results obtained in the uh, convolutional approach. Furthermore, we followed by the um, visualization of the grad cam, where we actually provide uh, coarse um, localization maps that highlights important region according to what our model actually sees. And we've done this in terms of healthy data and unhealthy data to see that, um, in fact, the model rely on local, uh, on global features for prediction in the form that all of the features we see in our data were actually highlighted for what decides what is to be pre predicted. And of course, um, um, local discriminability features are either not absent or are not even considered. Our statistical approach, where um, for a network activation, image and a lesion mask. We separated this using the, um, um, the lesion mask, which is the area of the lesion mask from the surrounding regions. And we perform um, some statistical data distribution between these to observe that um, the both variables are actually highly positively skewed. And for the analysis um, to test the relevance of the difference that may exist between these two regions shows a, a p-value of about 0.3. At this point, we actually evaluate the IOU and how it affects classifi classifiability. IOU because we seek to understand the um, influence of our tumor overlap on functional brain network activation maps, where we, of course, for region of either zero overlap or extreme overlap, we seek to understand if this is a strong deciding factor to what allow our um, correctly classified or misclassification cases. And at this point, we further understand that um, the two variables observe high similarity and, of course, belong to the same um, statistical data distribution. A further understanding of these in our entire data set shows that for different um, values of IOU, we see um, corresponding frequency between, for the true positive and, of course, the true negative for different values of this IOU. Next is where we actually seek to understand uh, more to assess the difference that may exist and which leads us to separate the network activation from, of course, the lesion mass uh, into the form of alpha and beta. And of course, uh, at the alpha, which is network, network activation with um, lesion overlap, and of course, beta, which is just network activation. And we perform some significance of the difference between these two to observe a p-value of uh, 0.48, which is in fact also statistically insignificant. And next, we uh, investigate the amount of pixel volume representing each functional brain network in, in the terms of healthy data and unhealthy data. Initially, one can observe that, of course, there is difference between these two, and we um, further tested to understand how important this difference may be to show a p-value of about um, 0.00076 which is statistically significant. And to put this all together, we can see that um, the activated volume uh, distribution in healthy and unhealthy data is the only, um, is statistically significant. And one can say, of course, the difference in volume um, of the volume pixels representing each of the functional brain network as uh, demonstrated is actually responsible for the data discrepancy. And of course, 
uh, it also suggests that, of course, global similarity, and of course, there is regional um, a difference that may exist in the data. As a summary, we have investigated the identified fMRI data discrepancy between healthy and unhealthy data. And convolutional approach has shown strong discrimin discriminability um, between healthy and unhealthy data. And among others, we identified that the volume of activated pixels of the cell functional brain network is statistically significant among the rest. And the healthy and unhealthy image data are indeed hard to distinguish, uh, especially at sub-regional level. To share our perspective of uh, chapter one, we observe limited model improvement through our data augmentation approach, uh, where we perform, of course, the clinical simulation, which could actually um, highlight the possibility of model overfitting. Uh, this is already a model overfitting because um, we have, at this point, very few data sets where we are more and more um, pushing the effort to acquire more healthy data to train model with um, larger data. And so at this point, we consider this to be a problem, especially when it is further highlighted by the limited improvement in our model um, training. And this pushes us, of course, to propose and to investigate and optimize fMRI data encoding approach, and of course, to simplify the deep learning approach by reducing the model training parameter. We present our initial framework at this point, which, in fact, um, compared to the um, graph neural network approach, where um, the convolutional neural network, which usually take our brain volume for some functional brain network activation, and of course, we've seen quite uh, some large amount of model parameter. We introduced the image dimension reduction approach, and of course, the graph um, encoding from our super pixel graph, which we generated. The dimension reduction actually allows us to generate other data, like the 2D uh, binary images, among the rest, from our original image data. And at this level, we evaluate using our convolutional neural network for all the entire data that gen generated to show that um, at this point, there is actually minimal influence of this um, dimension reduction to the model parameter reduction, as, as shown. Uh, and nevertheless, this remains a critical uh, step towards efficient encoding of more um, relationally structured data. Our image-based data extraction process, as illustrated here, from our superpixel image of um, functional brain network activation, we extracted each of the segments as partial embedding into graph nodes, and of course, we also um, encoded the um, node centroid information as graph edges using the KNN graph transformation. All of this was done, of course, to um, preserve the functional brain network and also to show the efficient representation of all of these features, the sub-regional features that exist in our image levels at the level of graph. Our initial comparison of results, here uh, we put side by side the case of a pre-trained model with the CNN um, training, the transfer learning from healthy to unhealthy cases with the CNN, where we uh, further train and fine tune with unhealthy data to achieve a result of about 78%. And of course, we compare this with the GNN approach, where we train and fine tune with unhealthy data using the uh, proposed graph neural network model, where we see um, a result of 70%. And we can say that, of course, we have um, recorded an accuracy drop of about 8% at this approach. Uh, nevertheless, this has amount to simplifying model. Um, model parameter in the case of GNN, when we compare this with um, the CNN scenario to a factor of about 26. While this is our initial approach, of course, better, uh, better brain volume encoding using the graph structured data can be explored. We talk about deep graph library or um, the grid graph approach, which are all quite a uh, fantastic opportunity to, to explore. As a summary, we have illustrated the use of self-supervision learning to avoid healthy data annotation. And of course, um, this has significantly has increased our, uh, our model accuracy by about 3%, especially in the case where um, no annotated healthy data was used. And then we 
have also um, significantly saved the time of declination. Sorry, we've saved uh, significantly the time of declination to allow focus on other sensitive stage in the brain tumor resection procedure. And for the summary of our chapter three, we have illustrated the observed data discrepancy between healthy and unhealthy data. And convolutional approach has in fact showed um, strong discriminability. And as revealed by our grad camp, and we could see that um, global features were in fact used and results from statistical approach suggest sub-regional features are difficult to distinguish. We identified, we, we identified the varying volume of functional network maps as a source of data discrepancy uh, shown in the case of healthy and unhealthy data. As a perspective of our chapter three, um, we proposed that of course a voxel level analysis could reveal a more interesting information where in fact from the acquired um, MRI image sequences, we could directly investigate any sharp uh, difference that may occur in the spatial temporal data at voxel level. To directly respond to our research, uh, raised research question of how we can automatically, um, we can automate the functional brain network recognition in healthy data, unhealthy data, knowing that uh, there is existence of limited unavailability. We have proposed uh, and demonstrated feature transferability using deep learning wage transfer from healthy to unhealthy data, which leads to um, these two publications. And uh, we have also seek to address the real research question at this point, where we propose that uh, the, uh, an illustrated contrastive self-supervision technique to avoid the laborious um, data um, annotation which leads to this um, international conference. And um, for the case of the investigating the source of our data discrepancy between healthy and unhealthy data, we responded to this to reveal that the difference in the activated um, volume features representing each of the functional brain network um, is responsible for the identified discrepancy. And as an extension, we have, of course, um, shared our initial results uh, with uh, a better encoding approach in the using our graph neural network extraction from our in initial image data. And for our general um, significance of this work, this research promotes an accelerated um, adoption of resting state fMRI modality in clinical routine, knowing fully well that the automated, um, the manual limitation has been reliably automated. Also, medical centers without research focus in pre operative uh, planning may now explore this opportunity for what we initially referred to as the, uh, the risk assessment and some of the identified uh, functional brain networks here could help in, in um, disease diagnosis and prognosis in terms of the um, DMN uh, network and of course uh, cell network as well. I, I want to see the, seize the opportunity to appreciate um, the entire members of the jury for taking the time of course to review my PhD. And I sincerely thank my supervisors for their relentless effort and um, patients throughout the PhD. And this PhD has been generously funded by the Petroleum Technology Development Fund Agency of Nigeria and uh, managed by Campus France under international studies. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>